Emerging nations such as Sri Lanka are highly dependent on selling commodities for their livelihood. They're also very sensitive to problems like climate change and fluctuating prices of natural resources, more so than developing nations. Today we are with Mr. Ravi Fernando, CEO of Slintec, the Sri Lankan Institute of Nanotechnology. So Ravi, what are the biggest issues uh, sustainability is facing in Sri Lanka today and how could we possibly address these? In terms of the issues that are faced in Sri Lanka, I would say, I would probably broad base it to issues faced in Asia. Because the Asian issues are pretty much the Sri Lankan issues. Asia today has two major sustainability issues. One is prompted through climate change. And one of the key areas that the world is beginning to obviously feel is the shortage of water. And you might say, okay, you always see uh, floods <laughs> in Asia and you wonder, uh, but then how can there be water shortages? But if you look at the United Nations environmental program map on water, uh, scarcity, by 2025, a good part of Asia, starting with India, will have major water shortages, physical water shortages. And not only physical water shortages, you're going to have both economic and physical water shortages. The second one is poverty. If one looks at poverty, the figures are that one in two people, even today, uh, earn less than $2 a day. And it's the World Bank figures. Now, a good percentage of that below $2 population is in Asia. So the two big challenges that Asia faces, I would say, is one of environmental sustainability because of the lack of resources, especially water. And the second one is poverty, and that is social sustainability. So how is Asia addressing them? I think the two Asian giants that are driving uh, people out of poverty is probably China, who has industrialized and is pr probably the world's factory today. I mean, manufacturing almost 60-70% of the world's goods. Now, they've been able to pull out of poverty roughly two to 300,000, 300 million people. Now, that is an amazing achievement that China has been able to uh, do in the last couple of years. In terms of addressing the poverty issue, while Southeast Asia has probably addressed it and come out of it, a good part of Southeast Asia, there are exceptions to every rule. But I would say the South Asian nation of India and China, these are the priority issues. And in terms of water management, I think what we have now is something like 70 to 80% of our water resources polluted. So there is a huge need to uh, clean up our rivers, clean up our lakes. There is a need to collect our rainwater, the rainwater we let go. Uh, thirdly, there is also a need for improved desalination in terms of the water that's around us. And some countries are probably far ahead of the curve than others on these issues. But I think the key point is that the world sustainability issues will also have a huge impact if Asia doesn't solve these issues. Because you would begin to have a whole group of new migration, which are, I would like to term them environmental migrants. And you might then have a situation because the Northern Hemisphere is rich, of, rich with water, water resources. The Southern Hemisphere has little or no water and dwindling resources, polluted resources. So some, they're going to have to move towards where their water is. So I think one way for the European Union and, and countries in the West to engage with these issues is to quickly give off their knowledge, their technology, to the Southern Hemisphere to address the issue of natural resource management. And secondly, to also look at bringing people out of poverty, but not necessarily uh, in a manner that then makes them huge, uh, bringing them out of poverty, but towards sustainable consumption. Um, developed countries would like to rebalance the responsibility of sustainable development more to emerging countries. Emerging countries feel that they need more leeway while they catch up. What is your opinion on that? Going back in time and going back in history, if one looks at how a lot of the development has taken place in the world, you can see that access to resources and synthesis of resources was something the developed world did well. 
Now, some of those resources were in the developing or not so developed part of the world. Now, if one was to look at rebalancing that, uh, and at the end of the day, knowledge, access to uh, technology are the two factors that have basically made the developed world developed uh, as opposed to the rest of the world. Now, at the end of the day, sustainability is a global issue. It is now a common and uh, it has to be a common responsibility. I don't think there's ever going to be a situation where the world is going to say, hey, we are the developed world, we are going to be all right, it's only the developing world that's going to go down under. The earth's going to go down under, <laughs> right? And that is the bottom line. So that now, if the developed world and the developing world don't see this as a common objective and a common goal to manage sustainability in a manner that is going to finally survive the world, I think we are all losing this battle. And time has come to put aside uh, country boundaries, regional boundaries, boundaries created by oceans, and to look beyond all this and ask the question, what are the key issues we need to really address in managing a sustainable world? And I think the issues would rank in order of the whole issue of natural resources be getting exhausted, forest covers getting depleted, global warming, carbon emissions. At the end of the day, today, if one looks at the top five emitters of the world, today, you find that the highest emitters are obviously uh, US yet, but China not too far behind. Then you have uh, India, I mean, you got the uh, other Asian nations coming in, Japan's in there. Now, how do we manage carbon emissions? And I think the real issue that has to be addressed in terms of the developing world, the developing world's energy requirements are quadrupling. They are quadrupling because lots of people are coming out of poverty. People are now wanting a better lifestyle. They want to buy their car. They want to buy their fridge. They want to buy their television set. And all this is adding to the huge uh, emissions issue. So how do, does the developing developed world then address this issue? I think, A, I think technology. I really believe that solving the energy crisis has got to be a global partnership. There, there can never be a sustainable world if we are not able to solve the energy crisis. So here we are, a fossil fuel-based world. Everything is about petroleum. Now, if we keep uh, feeding that uh, dangerous uh, world, then obviously we're not going to have any control of this whole issue. So I think there has to be new technology. There has to be a use of wind, uh, the use of tide, tidal uh, uh, energy. We, we've got to go for solar in a much bigger way. And there has to be new technology and research and innovation there. And they should be transplanting some of this uh, new in energy, uh, renewable energy opportunities into the developed, developing world. And I would say that really is priority number one in terms of how do, does the developed world engage with the development world in the solution of a more renewable and long-lasting energy solution. Second one is we yet know in terms of per capita consumption, the developed world's per capita consumption is significantly higher in terms of even the whole emission side of things. So I think there has also to be a consumer management of lowering consumption towards sustainable consumption. And I think if I was to pick on two big challenges, I would say energy for the developed world with technology and innovation and managing consumption in the developed world. And basically, I would say for sustainability to come to life, for global sustainability to really take place, three things have to happen. The first one is governments must have sustainable policies. And these sustainable policies must not be simply policies that give you a tick on, the, uh, on a global review. They must be meaningful sustainable policies which are relevant to that nation that addresses the economic, environmental, and social issues. And these policies must encourage 
both business and consumers to move towards sustainability. That's, I would say, the first part of this strategy. Second part is where business then stem from, stemming from the policies that are in place say there's a huge opportunity for sustainable business. We have a great opportunity to move towards green business, green economies, and it makes sense for the world. Now, unless the policies are in place, business isn't going to go there. And there has to be a huge, huge uh, decision. And we need leaders with sustainable mindsets to lead business in the future. Because if you don't have managers and leaders with vision for sustainable business, then all the policies will remain in a document and business will not utilize it. If these two things come to place and come to being then, consumption and consumers will have no option but to move towards sustainable consumption. At the moment, there are enlightened consumers, but at the end of the day, enlightened consumers can't be paying premium price forever and ever. And the only way the premium price is going to come down is where policy and business are absolutely attacking this issue. And then there's only one option, the sustainable consumption option. So I think these three factors have to come together. And I think the developed world has a role in making it come together. What is interesting in a good part of Asia is that more than 50% of the population are women. And in most cases, you find that they're not engaged in the economy in most countries. And somehow, I think this is a huge fallacy because if only half the world's, half the population of the world of a country is working towards its economic progress, then you have half the impact. In Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka has had a huge uh, history of social sustainability through women's empowerment. And I think we have had the first women prime minister in the world. Uh, and we have also, therefore, had uh, equal voting rights at a very early stage. And here was an economy that somehow had engaged the women in, in, in society into economic endeavor. However, not really compensating them or giving them the kind of equal equality that gender demands. One could almost say that Sri Lanka's economy is being sustained by the efforts of women. But these ladies were always at the bottom end of the curve in terms of income, in terms of uh, management of their uh, resources, in terms of how they were looked upon, stigmas attached to these ladies. As I saw how the world's developed nations were moving in the area of sustainability, there was a new trend towards ethical sourcing and ethical consumerism. And uh, starting with some of the issues that happened uh, in the 90s, where companies were getting absolutely into trouble because of their poor work ethic in terms of managing the people working in this industry, especially in, in countries like Vietnam, in China, and uh, in India. We found that Sri Lanka had a, a very different attitude to how these ladies had to be managed. But yet, in terms of real economic benefits, much more had to be done. And the company I worked for for five years as director of sustainability and corporate branding, I, I, I saw that we had something unique. However, we just needed to bring together the best practices in our, in our different uh, factories and turn it into a huge competitive advantage. So we created a program which looked at three basic issues. We looked at career advancement, and we looked at a whole host of programs to strengthen career advancement. Secondly, we had a section on work-life balance. And here, I engaged with some of the leading companies of uh, Sri Lanka and multinationals. And I said, join hands with us, and let's give these ladies something worth going for. So for example, uh, I launched a program with HSBC the bank. And we launched a program on managing personal finance. And this was a certificate program for apparel workers. We also did a program with Unilever. And Unilever hap happened to be my first company, so it was easy to get them on board. And I said, guys, here are ladies uh, who are no different to any other lady. They also have aspirations. They like to live, look good. They like to feel good. And they also need help in terms of how they manage life. 
And we created a program called a Unilever Go Beyond program, where we had two modules, one on health and hygiene, one on grooming. And we did a whole certificate program for the ladies. And last but not least, we had an annual uh, awards program, which was the rewarding excellence bit of it, third part of the program, where each year, from every one of our factories, peers would recommend a lady who they thought had gone beyond. And this then was the final part of the program where they would be given extremely attractive cash awards and we would make them heroes in the company. And what it did for us was create a complete different attitude amongst the workforce. We now had the lowest attrition rate in terms of the industry where the attrition rate was in the 20 to 25 percent region. We had brought it down to 4 percent. And more than that, we had a more engaged workforce, more committed workforce, and they all aspired to become Go Beyond winners. This program then became the national strategy. And today, Sri Lanka positions itself in the world of apparel as the garments without guilt country. But I'm, I'm sincerely humbled to think that a little idea, uh, which we started in 2005, three, became a national strategy. Ravi Fernando, thank you very much for being with us here on NCI Knowledge. Thank you very much.